Monday. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. This is the show where we look at a case and what was the critical piece or sometimes pieces that helped to solve it. And we want to give a very big thank you to Elena McGee for asking us to cover today's case. Of course, I personally want to give a very big thank you to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing it up. It's one that I like to call Catch Me If You Camp. Ballarat is an unincorporated ghost town in Inyo County, California, west of Death Valley National Park. Founded in 1897 as a supply point for local gold mines, this waypoint was named after Ballarat, Australia. At the height of its popularity, Ballarat had about 500 residents and included seven saloons, three hotels, a Wells Fargo station, post office, school, a jail, and a morgue. No churches could be found, as miners and prospectors in the region just wanted a place to relax when they came to town. As the local mines became tapped out, all but the post office would close its doors, leaving only the most die-hard desert dwellers. But by the early 1900s, even they gave the town back to the desert. Since that time, Ballarat has seen a resurgence in popularity. It's been featured in books, still has graffiti from the Manson family who lived nearby. It was also featured in the movie Easy Rider. Today, the town is still used as a waypoint, mostly for four-wheel drive expeditions into the Panamint Mountain Range and, of course, Death Valley. One man named Rocky Novak stays there year-round with his dogs Potlicker and Brownie to run the general store and supply tourists on the weekends. In the summer of 2003, Rocky was hearing about items being stolen from camping sites. Then, someone broke into Rocky's general store and stole $4,000 worth of supplies. The thief was so meticulous that he left no tracks or fingerprints, and this same man was seen walking alone in the park by visitors. This quickly earned him the nickname, the Ballarat Bandit. Because they had so little evidence, police were left with nothing to go on but the hope that the robber would steal again and maybe this time leave behind some type of evidence. One couple met a smiling and friendly man who they greeted as they walked back to their car. The couple might have not been so polite and friendly if they had known that the man had just robbed their vehicle while they were out hiking. The next group to meet the bandit were four police officers from, from Los Angeles who were in the area on vacation. Their group came upon a lone man in the park who said he was just there on an overnight trip. But the officers noticed that his ATV was loaded with tarps, water, gas containers, and a 30 6 rifle with a scope. This made the officers suspicious. So as they walked away, a member of the group snapped a picture of the man. This would turn out to be the only photo ever taken of the bandit alive in the U.S. When the group made it back to the Inyo County Sheriff's Department, their suspicions prompted them to show local law enforcement the picture they had taken. Sheriff's deputies knew immediately who they were looking at. Burglaries were one thing, but now they had evidence that the bandit was armed and could be a danger to the public. They decided to step up their efforts in finding him. On January 21st, 2004, a team of about 30 National Forest Service officers, Highway Patrol, and SWAT team members began searching on foot and by Black Hawk helicopter in a sealed off section of the park called Butte Valley to investigate a suspicious looking campsite. What they found was alarming. The camp was hidden in an area with little vegetation that would flood during certain times of the year, effectively erasing evidence of the camp's existence. Unfortunately, the bandit was nowhere to be found. Two weeks later, tracks from an all-terrain vehicle were found near the Manson family hideout known as Barker Ranch. Searchers followed the tracks up a mountain where they found the bandit at a camp next to a spring. Officers were able to creep up to about 50 feet away from him before he got spooked and ran. Despite radioing for help, which included a plane with night vision equipment, the Ballarat bandit disappeared. What they found at his new camp would cause an even bigger uproar with law enforcement. They found military maps as well as more supplies and guns, suggesting the man had some kind of paramilitary training. Because this was only a couple years after 9-11, officers began to wonder if the man was a terrorist who was mapping military installations in the desert. 
Unfortunately, these questions would not be answered anytime soon. Over the next 11 months, ranchers as far east as Nye County, Nevada, reported stolen food, weapons, and vehicles. New campsites were found, some even on the outskirts of Area 51. But no matter how careful law enforcement was, the bandit always eluded them. Sergeant Russ Peterson of the Washoe County Sheriff's Office admits the man was incredibly fit. Quote, he would run into the mountains to get away. Searchers would actually watch him with binoculars as he ran for miles and miles. He liked to travel in darkness, he said. Law enforcement officers doubled and tripled their forces, some spending 16 hours a day in the field. Roads were dragged to show fresh tracks, wanted posters were shown, and roadblocks were set up, but somehow the bandit always got around them. Finally, a chance find by a park ranger on July 23rd of 2004 would lead officials in the right direction. Ranger Dave Brennan was driving through Johnson Valley inside Death Valley Park when he spotted a yellow flatbed truck with ramps indicating someone had unloaded an ATV. Upon closer inspection, he found marijuana seedlings in buckets under the truck along with a stolen credit card. That far into the park, he could neither radio for help or call on his cell, so the ranger was forced to disable the truck before leaving the area to return with help. When officers did return, they saw fresh ATV tracks leading away from the vehicle into the valley. Traveling through the park in July can be very dangerous, and over the next two days, the bandit traveled 70 miles in 120 degree heat. The next report received was on July 25th. A park ranger saw a man fitting the bandit's description at a call box on Highway 127, lying on the ground with a gas can. He went to an area where he could radio in the description and was immediately told to go back. This is the guy that they've been looking for. When he returned to the call box, the man was gone. A new posse equipped with an airplane scoured the region until they found a campsite nearby covered with a camouflage tarp. As officers approached, they could finally see the man they had pursued for so many months. With guns drawn, they started their slow approach. Before they could apprehend their suspect, the man took off all his clothes, put a gun to his head, and ended his own life. The officials had their man, but they still didn't know who he was. When his fingerprints were run through databases, no matches were found. Dental records were looked at, but again, they just couldn't find a match. For the next year, officials would continue trying to find out just who this man was. As a last-ditch effort, a mass email was sent to other coroners around the country with the man's picture and vital statistics in the hope that he would be rec recognized. An email tip received that October would finally put the investigation into perspective. The tipster asked, Who talks like an American, looks like an American, acts like an American, but isn't American? A Canadian. Maybe the bandit was a Canadian. Maybe the Royal Canadian Mounted Police might be able to provide some help. Officers would spend another four months going from one Canadian agency to another for a fingerprint search before finally receiving positive confirmation of the man's identity. His name was George Robert Johnston. Born in 1954 in Prince Edward Island, Canada, Rob, as he was known to his friends and family, lived and worked in the area as a drywaller. At the age of 31, he met his 19-year-old wife, Tommy, while she danced at a local biker bar. The two would go on to have four daughters before, tragically, in 1997, Tommy was diagnosed with leukemia. Looking for a way to ease his wife's pain, Rob started to grow marijuana on their farm. A small growing operation soon developed into one of the largest marijuana crops ever grown on Prince Edward Island with an estimated street value of between five and six million dollars. And it was discovered by accident. One day, a neighbor's pig wandered through a hole in Rob's fence, and when the neighbor went to retrieve him, he found the plants and called local authorities. At the time of arrest, Royal, Royal Canadian Mounted Police took 3,784 plants from the farm. Rob, was found guilty of manufacturing and selling, and received a sentence of eight years in prison, of which he only served a year and a half before being paroled. After his release in 2000, he started to miss appointments with his parole officer before 
eventually completely vanishing. In 2006, authorities finally had their identification. Because they had no contact information for Tommy or his daughters, the police's next step was to contact Rob's parents and tell them of their son's death. Because of a long-standing feud between his parents and the rest of his family, Rob's parents chose not to tell his wife or children what had happened. But months later, his 16-year-old daughter decided to Google her father's name, and they found out the truth. Tommy states that just weeks after his incarceration, Rob suffered a breakdown from which he never fully recovered. His breakdown, which she believes was caused by medications given to him while in prison, left her husband unable to support his family. After that, I'd find him in the closet, pulling his beard, she said. He couldn't feel anything. He was lost. He then pulled away from everyone. In 2000, he started missing parole appointments, and in late 2002, he told his family that he wanted to travel from Canada to the United States to seek help from a faith healer. From that point on, his wife lost contact with him, and by 2003, he had begun his criminal career, burglarizing areas of Ballarat, ending with a single shot at his lonely campsite. Tommy feels that there is much more to her husband's story. She claims that authorities mistreated and harassed her husband in their efforts to find him. She also claims that her husband never used any rifle or handgun, so how was he shot by one? After her husband's arrest in 1997, the couple's four children were taken into protective custody, their property was seized, and Tommy herself was remanded into rehab, where she admitted to using marijuana for her illness. This and his confinement sent him into a downward spiral. She wasn't surprised that her husband had been hiding in the desert. After all, she said Johnston was drawn to the desert, where he enjoyed searching for gold and hunting aliens. Survival courses he had taken, along with the valley's harsh conditions, helped to sharpen his already formidable outdoor skills. She said he had a dream of using solar panels to grow marijuana in an abandoned mine in Death Valley. Quote, he was our provider and supporter, and when he couldn't do that anymore, he couldn't live with himself, said Tommy. She also feels that his fear of being incarcerated again contributed to his decision to end his life. Today, Rob is buried in an unmarked grave in a potter's field in San Bernardino, California. His family plans to raise the money to have him move to a grave on Prince Edward Island, but have so far been unable to do so. In 2018, Canada and California legalized recreational use of marijuana. Case cracked. I'd like to give a big thank you to Wikipedia, the Anderson Valley Advertiser, CBC News Canada, and YankeeBarbarino.com. Be sure to check out True TV's The Investigators. This case was actually featured on an episode called Lone Fugitive. And if you want to listen to a podcast about this, check out Dark Poutine's episode, The Ballarat Bandit. I got to tell you guys, this story just leaves me unsettled, and that's kind of why I wanted to add that tag at the end about, you know, now marijuana is legal in Canada and California, basically the one place uh, where he got busted and then the other place he went to trying to not get busted, um, and it's legal for recreational use. And here, I, I think admittedly with the grow operation that he was doing back in Canada, obviously that was for way more than just his wife's use. But at least from what we hear, the original intent was a medicinal use um, for helping his wife with leukemia. So there's just something about this story that just, it, it, it kind of bothers me because we have a man that is struggling and um, and I, I don't know that there wasn't some type of mental disorder that he might have been dealing with around all this as well. Um, I mean, just the comments that we heard from Tommy certainly sounds like there might be something at play. And who knows what prompted it? Maybe it was medication he was given while he was incarcerated. Maybe it was something outside of that. I don't know. Um, but it just seems like this guy was suffering in a way. And I feel like it's kind of unfortunate that it ended the way that 
it did. I mean, here we had law enforcement, you know, being worried about terrorism, and I totally understand that. And then finding these maps and saying, hey, look, this guy's planning something. I mean, it's not exactly a manifesto, but, you know, he's got guns, he's got maps, he's robbing supplies, and he's getting away from them every time. I could see why they had cause for concern. Um, and especially keep in, keep in mind the time frame. I mean, I know a lot of us were on high alert after what had happened uh, at, on 9-11. But um, it just seems to me like this is just a bit of a missed opportunity to, to bring this guy in and maybe get him the services he needs to really deal with what he's struggling with and then maybe give him another chance at life. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a terrible outcome. There's, I don't think there's any other way to say it. And for a guy that's stealing, you know, even thousands of dollars from a general store or stuff, I mean, you know, does he really deserve to lose his life, lose his life in that way? Uh, I personally don't think so. And the other aspect to this is the maps, were they really about terrorism? Maybe. I mean, I guess if he was using those to find locations of places that he was going to steal from, I, you might be able to consider that some form of terrorism, but I personally don't think so. Tommy says that he had this dream of, you know, having an underground grow operation in Death Valley specifically. And we know that that's where he's at when this story kind of kicks off. So um, was that what the maps were actually for? And in another interesting question, um, did he actually accomplish what he was trying to do? I mean, we're, we're talking a, a matter of some years here. Did, did he actually build whatever he was trying to build out there? Uh, is it maybe even still out there? Who knows? I just really wish that we could have seen uh, a North Pond hermit ending to this. And if you guys aren't familiar with that, just search the channel. We have a case cracked where kind of a similar story, but the guy is actually brought in, um, I would say somewhat rehabilitated and given another shot at becoming a member of society, which even in that story is kind of a, a sad angle because it seems like he just really wanted to be alone. He just wanted to live in the woods and he didn't really want to have to deal with people. Um, but, you know, it's it's tough. Um, we are a society and we do have norms. And in some way, you know, if you're outside of those norms, some really bad things can happen to you. And I feel like that's what we see happen in both of these cases. I'd like to give a big thank you to PayPal supporters Brandy Fry and Audrey Schmidt, who you guys might remember that name because she was interviewed on the channel about the death of her sister, Jessica Easterly. Audrey, that was really sweet. You, you definitely didn't have to do that, but I very much appreciate it. And of course, um, the money is going to go to a good place. So thank you so much, Audrey, for making that contribution. And if you guys don't know about the Jessica Easterly case, please check out the Brain Scratch episodes. There's three of them on it. I'm very, very proud of the interviews in particular. I didn't know that we were going to be talking about domestic violence in such a way. And it really kind of woke me up to that issue in a bit of, of, of a different way. As a matter of fact, we have an episode of Three Men and a Mystery coming out that um, domestic violence kind of rides strongly as a topic in that episode as well. Uh, and it's just making me think about how can I focus on this a little more and kind of bring that to the channel a little more to hopefully give people some stories of experience, some tools to deal with that, and maybe some warning signs about getting out of those types of situations. And Audrey uh, played a very big part of that in terms of um, bringing Jessica's story to me and then agreeing to the interview and bringing her friends to the interview and letting that all happen. So thank you so much, Audrey. I also got a PayPal contribution and message from a lady named Susie. And she actually sent a message that says, I've just seen a program on Danny Oberg. My heart went out to his family. His poor father broke my heart. Please update. Uh, and then she also said some very nice things about myself and how I handled the interview. Uh, I have actually been in touch with Ken. I've literally just looked at a message right before I kicked on the camera from him. Um, I'm trying to see if there is enough new information to pull together some type of follow-up episode. I've heard they've also had a very another tragedy in the family. Um, but I will see if there is something we can do to help re-raise exposure to that case. It is a terrible case. Uh, I know some people are concerned there might be some type of uh, police cover-up element or maybe just them not working the case as hard as they could be. 
Um, so we'll see if, uh, if Ken feels okay about coming on the channel and sharing some more stuff with all of you. But uh, thank you so much for sending that message. If you'd like to support the channel, you could do that over at www.lordnarts.com. On the upper right, you can see the button for PayPal or Patreon, or you can buy merchandise there. All of it helps keep me here doing what I love doing, sharing these stories with you that we can learn from, and hopefully we can apply these things in our own lives or sometimes to other cases we're looking at here on the channel that are unsolved. So thank you for being a viewer of Case Cracked. I'll see you back here on Wednesday with a brand new episode of Searchlight on the Lord and Arts channel. Mm -hmm.